so many guys out there wake up one day and they realize that they've been sold a bill of goods in the way that they're supposed to talk to women and communicate women and what women actually expect and what women actually want. It's not what they see on TV. It's not what they see in advertisements. It's not what they definitely not what they see in a Tom Hanks movie. It's something else, but they don't know what it is. So they go out and they look for the answers. Women aren't really concerned so much with whether you're a nice guy or you're an asshole. This is a false dichotomy. What women are concerned with is, are, do you have values that you stand up for? Do you have something that you're after? Do I have to carry the burden of being the center of your universe so that you're constantly trying to please me? That's, that's too much effort. The slower you can go with somebody up to a point, the more accurate the information you're going to get and the more different ways you can look at a variable, the more accurate your picture is going to become. And so getting to know somebody is really that process of going slowly and looking at them from as many angles as you can. Dr. Sean T. Smith is a psychologist and author from Colorado. In 2006, he earned a doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of Denver, and he has worked in private practice since then, offering therapy and coaching with a focus on male clients. Many men come seeking clarity on the role of women in their lives. He is the author of several books, including The Tactical Guide to Women, How Men Can Manage Risk and Dating in Marriage, and The Practical Guide to Men, How to Spot the Hidden Traits of Good Men and Great Relationships. Sean, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thanks for having me on. Yes. Um, so we will have a chance to talk about uh, many different things on this episode. Um, first and foremost, your books. But um, do you want to maybe tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your clinical work as a psychologist? Um, I know that uh, in the description we said many men come seeking uh, advice on dealing with women and relationships and sexual issues, but um, are there other issues that you are seeing frequently when you deal with male clients? Well, I'll, I'll keep it brief so I don't give you the boring version of the you know, long bio of my career, but I started out working with anxiety disorders primarily, and I started working with couples also early in my career. And one of the things I noticed early on was that guys were making these guys were all making the same mistakes with choosing women it was like nobody ever told these guys that you can choose women who are kind to you for example or who have good emotional maturity and so forth so that that's when i really started taking my career in that direction of working specifically with men although i still work with couples and and yeah, still work with women too but um yeah that, that's sort of the short version of how i got to where i am mm -hmm. okay and um so I guess maybe we can get into a few of the issues that you talk about in your books. Um, I noticed that between these two books, one is intended for women, one for men, and they're basically about how to choose a good partner and avoid a bad partner, if I can yeah. sum it up very, very high level. Um, but there's a lot of um, mirrors or parallels between the two in terms of the qualities that you recommend. Um, a few of them in the... Look in the book on uh, searching for a woman. Uh, you mentioned the bright triad of emotional maturity, mental stability, and clarity of intention. Mm -hmm. And in the book for women looking for men, it's sense of purpose first, and good mental health and emotional maturity. So um, I'll turn it over to you, maybe with the the overlap uh, topics, which are the mental stability and the emotional maturity. Can you tell our audience why those two qualities are so important to look for when you're um, when you're dating and looking for a partner? Well, sure. We'll start with ma emotional maturity, and I break them down in each book, and I think I treat them a, a little bit differently in each book. What women should be looking for men, and vice versa. And the reason it matters so much emotional maturity is because you're going to have disagreements with this person, and if they don't have, know how to navigate those disagreements, and the disagreements just start to take over the relationship and take over your life, and so you want somebody who can handle themselves when there's some rough waters, handle themselves when their job's not going well, or when you're having a disagreement about how you know about little things or about big things like how how to raise the children. You want somebody who can negotiate with you, and as far as mental health. Um, 
I think I made a similar point in each book. I sort of broke down what men tend to struggle with and what women tend to struggle with. But I think that the, the main takeaway point there is that it doesn't necessarily matter what a person is that a person is struggling with something because there are these garden variety mental illnesses like anxiety, depression, substance abuse. They're just out there. They're just part of the world. And it's part of everyone's life. And, and in a sense, you don't really want someone who's never struggled with anything. You want someone who's had to overcome a little bit of hardship. And the main thing to look for in a potential mate is, are they willing to address their depression, their anxiety, their, their substance abuse? Do they, do they internalize responsibility for it? And do they take care of it? And that's really the big issue. It's not that they never struggled with anything. It's that whatever they have struggled with, they're getting a handle on it. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, nobody goes through life totally unscathed. And no. I guess what you're saying is the, the real uh, challenge is, or the real question in, in character is, how is a person dealing with the challenges that they are facing? Yeah, for sure. And, and are they willing to uh, admit them, seek help when they need it? Or, you know, I guess there's dysfunctional ways as well, ig ignoring them, projecting them out onto other people and other methods, right? Yeah, I'd, I'd say the, the big two ways that people avoid their own problems are either by avoidance, you know, all kinds of avoidance strategies from gambling to sex to alcohol to pot to whatever, anything that takes you away from the pain for a little bit. Of course, it always comes back, sometimes harder. And then there's the personality stuff, projecting your your hostility, for example, onto other people. And if you're really good at it, you can even get them to act out your hostility. And then you get to say, oh, see, I'm right. It belongs to them, not me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I want to ask you to continue on this topic on the the practical guide to men. Um, sorry, no, I guess it's the other one. Um, it's for men looking for women, which is the tactical guide to women. You don't list in your three qualities to look for youth and beauty. And yet I think that uh, as a man, we, we all have experience of watching other men go for that first and foremost. And sometimes that's the only thing they go for is young, beautiful women. They just stop there. That's their whole list is two things. Yeah. And um, so I, I want you to explain a little bit about why that is insufficient and what problems might occur if a man is choosing that and ignoring the other important qualities that you've listed. Well, I think there's a couple of ways you can look at the dating pool out there and the people that are available to you. You can go for the person that is most attractive to you. Let's say that there's a group of people who are very attractive to you. And among those people, you you find the one that maybe sort of comes close to your values and, and supporting your purpose in life and having the same goals in, in life. Or you can find the people who are most aligned with your values and your purpose, and you can find the attractive one in there. And so guys are usually looking for TNA first, and then the values are, especially if you're a young guy, the values and the purpose are a distant second concern. Rather than approaching it and saying, I need someone who their values line up with mine, and their purpose lines up with mine, and then I'm gonna find the hot ones among that group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm approaching 40 pretty soon, and uh, I've noticed a big change in the men in their late teens, early 20s, versus the men in their late 30s, early 40s, mm -hmm. um, and also in women too, in terms of what becomes a priority and what becomes not, you know, the, yeah. the things that rise up and the things that fall down on your list. Yeah, what, so what have I you really noticed like your, among the men? Um, the, the people who chose women as partners solely based on youth and beauty and not much else, they usually regretted that uh, mm. because they got into trouble. So, you, you know, sometimes they ended up marrying those women and then had a divorce because they realized, oh, her values are not in line with mine. Um, our personalities don't really click, even though, you know, maybe the sex is good and some other things are good. But you spend probably 95 plus percent of your time with your partner engaged in non-sexual activity. So, mm -hmm. and when you think about just on a sheer time basis, um, all of the, uh, the, the friendship, the trust, the mutual support, working towards common goals, having similar values about uh, family and religion and children and money and time, I've noticed that 
those are really important in a partner and that will make or break a relationship. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And by no means am I saying you should pick someone who you find repulsive or just not your not your thing physically because that 95% of the time that you spend not having sex with them, you're going to be in their presence, obviously. And so you want someone who's attractive, but the mistake both sides make and, and women and men look for different things. They're, they're young men and young women will put the value second and the attractiveness first. Yes, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, I think the female corollary of youth and beauty would be perhaps uh, status and money and maybe throw height in there as well in mm -hmm. terms of the superficial things they often look for in men. And um, would you say that if they follow the same mistakes, they're going to encounter similar pitfalls or, or consequences later on? Yeah, I would. And this is kind of an interesting thing. If I can take a little bit of a left turn here, you know, there's this information out there from, I think, OkCupid and maybe Tinder that I, I, don't, I don't know which site generated the, the data, but that only a few men are successful on Tinder, for example, and all the women are successful. And so the women are going for the top 20% of men and the men are going for anyone that will have them. And so this is really a discouraging message for guys on Tinder that only the top 10 or 20% are getting any traction at all on Tinder. And I think it's an inaccurate message because I think that one of the things that's happening there, and I, this is just my speculation, I don't have any data to back this up, but when men, when women are sizing up men, they're sizing up not just physical appearance, but they're sizing up the way he carries himself, the way he speaks, the way he's connected to other people, his sense of humor, the way he looks you in the eye. They're, they're, women are sizing up a lot of nonverbal and non-physical cues, a lot of behavioral cues. And so when all you see on something like Tinder is a picture, you're losing, I, I'm gonna pick a random number here, you're losing 90% of what women actually assess in men. And so men who go on that site, on that kind of site, they're setting themselves up for failure. Um, you probably, most men are gonna have better luck just out in the real world where they can, they can advertise those other qualities because most guys are average looking, right? That, that's the definition of average. And I think women who go on those sites are kind of setting themselves up for failure because they're training themselves to look for the wrong cues, or, or at least maybe it's more accurate to say they're not practicing looking for cues that are more meaningful. Like how does the guy carry himself? How does he speak? Does he have a sense of humor? Is he intelligent? Does he seem to have some sort of social capital that he carries with him? Those are much more important questions. Yes, exactly. And, um, the, the dating apps have, of course, their pros and cons. Mm -hmm. um, the pros are they they put your face in front of a lot of potential partners very quickly and easily with a relatively low investment of time and money. Um, but the con, of course, is that it reduces you to that profile. A few pictures, a short description, and not much else. Yeah. Um, and I've found that uh, none of the dating apps will are a good predictor of relationship success because they don't have one of the most important things which is the spark of chemistry or attraction which in my experience you can only sense when you're sitting physically in a room with somebody yeah and you see their body language you listen to their tone of voice you watch how they interact with other people like you're just getting a static profile um where you you can't sense that through an electronic uh, interface, but when you're in a room, such as a cocktail party or a bar or a, you know someone's kitchen, you get much more of a, a, a deeper intuition about who yeah. someone really is. Yeah, and there's so much of that that's nonverbal and and maybe even non-visual. You can you can sort of feel other people's presence, and when somebody walks in the room that really clicks with you, there's something very ethereal about. The, the connection that you get with them. You can't get that on, on dating websites. And there's all kinds of different tiers of dating websites. And I think that one of the things that separates the, the low success ones from the high success ones is barrier of entry. So you have something like Tinder that's low barrier of interest, entry, low cost, low risk, no low investment. And then you have ones like um, eHarmony that's a lot higher barrier of entry in terms of cost and the amount of information they provide. And then something else that I think seems to be making a comeback and, and will make an even bigger, I think it's going to get bigger and bigger, is matchmakers. I'm, I'm talking to guys who are actually going to matchmakers, and some of these matchmakers 
actually seem to be invested in what they're doing, depending on how their incentive structure is set up. They're, they're actually invested in connecting people who they think are going to click and they're invested in those people having a second date sometimes monetarily. So it's, it's in the matchmaker's best interest if there's a success there. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that kind of thing as a counterbalance to the effect of these dating apps. Well, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I've seen those services around and I'm not sure if they're going to make a comeback. But if they do, that would be, uh, I think, a surprise to many people. Um, but it would illustrate that that uh, partnering up with someone is a complex process and many people are not really good at doing it by themselves, <laughs> perhaps. Well, um, and or that they yeah. they're missing important information, especially young guys. You're supposed to as a young guy, you're supposed to be making big decisions about your life when you have no information. You're supposed to be committing to women when you don't know what that means. You're supposed to be choosing your path. And why well, I guess guys get some latitude. But, you know, one of the one of the requirements of being a man is that you have a path that you're on and you start you need to pick a direction early and um, nothing says you can't switch. But to your point young men are making big decisions particularly with women when they probably should be holding off till 30 or so when they have a little more experience under their belt right exactly um so also in your books i noticed uh one of the themes in both is the question of why good men and good women often don't find each other or it's difficult for them to find each other and you talked about um we tend to be attracted to shiny surfaces Mm. which is things like uh, youth, beauty, height, money, is the things you notice right away about a person, um, which I think are kind of biologically driven, perhaps. Um, but can you talk about um, why it is, why that's difficult, and how can we overcome that difficulty of finding a good partner? You know, I don't remember exactly what I wrote about that. I think that was in the, the Practical Guide to Men, which is a few years old for me, and I've not revisited it um, at all uh the tactical guide to women has sort of become my baby that's that's the one that i really um, that i really click with these days mm -hmm. although i still like the old one but yeah people do get attached attached to those shiny surfaces and it sort of goes back to what we were talking about before that the way to assess people is to go slowly because this is and this is something that psychology is really good at um, our, our profession is bad at a lot of things there's a lot of criticisms you can make of our profession i'm a very vocal critic of our of my profession but one of the things we're really good at is knowing how to look at things in a systematic slow way so for example um, neurocognitive assessment if somebody has a, a brain injury or a stroke or something we have all these tests where we can really zero in on the nature of the injury in ways that an mri machine cannot so that you can tailor the treatment and um, and we've also gotten very good at measuring things like iq measuring things like the big five personality traits we have these things where there are just mountains of data out there and one of the lessons from these mountains of data and these population norms is that the slower you can go with somebody up to a point the more accurate the information you're going to get and the more different ways you can look at a variable the more accurate your picture is going to become and so getting to know somebody is really that process of going slowly and looking at them from as many angles as you can you obviously can't do that on tinder you can't do that in the first year of dating somebody when you're infatuated with them you can't do that in the first 18 months maybe only when the infatuation stage starts to end and your neurochemistry starts to come back to baseline can you then start to see yourself and them a little more clearly that's a very important message and i think everyone should write that down right now um, go slowly and your biology is telling you one thing it's probably saying you know hurry up and get with this person and go go all the way to the end right away but uh it's in your interest to go slowly and be careful and, and observe your partner and see them in different situations, right? Yeah, and when I talk about different angles, I'm talking about like watching very closely the way they interact with people, listening very closely to the way their friends and family talk about them, listening very closely to the way your friends and family talk about them. And sometimes that's a that's unpleasant information you don't want to hear it and it's really difficult to stay in touch with the facts there because your friends might be making dropping little hints that this person and eh, not such a high quality person or maybe they're a good person but they're not good for you and but you don't want to hear it because your biology and you've got all these 
the, these neurochemicals that have shifted from baseline a little bit in your brain because you're infatuated and it's literally shaping the way you, you view the world. Yes. So it's, it's good to illustrate that and, and keep it in the back of your mind, always being aware of how your evolved biology and psychology is, is uh, pushing you to do certain things. And um, nobody, I think no one gets hurt by going a little bit more slowly. No, but you're you're ac- absolutely right. Our bodies want us to go very quickly. We 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 have these compulsions to get the puppy and to get the apartment with this person and to make big life altering decisions at precisely the time when we should not be making life altering decisions because our brains are out of whack. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, there was another uh, segment in the book. Uh, I can't remember. Maybe it was in both books, but it really caught my attention, which is that women are not very attracted to agreeable men. And I mean in psychological trait agreeableness. Mm-hmm. Um, so in layman's terms, we might call this, you know, the nice guy syndrome. Um, would you, I guess you wrote it, so um, maybe you can explain a little bit more. What do you mean that women are not attracted to the typical nice guy or the agreeable man? It's a, it's a really tricky topic because there's this old dichotomy that men create that they they project onto women that women only like the nice guy who simps for them and brings them flowers and and gets down on one knee and is always giving them exactly what they want or that guy who acts that way looks around and see women dating the asshole am i allowed to cuss on here sorry sure okay she sees him dating the asshole the guy that is really disagreeable and treats people poorly sometimes. And so the, the nice guy, quote unquote, nice guy is a great book by Robert Glover about the, the, the behavior that can surround a person who, a man who has taken the viewpoint that if he is nice to the world and if he is nice to women, then the women and the world will be nice to him in return. And of course it doesn't work out that way. And so this person ends up pretty angry and, and under, you know, justifiably so, I guess, because he's laboring under a false impression. But the nice guys think that women only want to date the assholes because that's what they see. And, and what's really going on there is, I th- and, and there's quite a bit of data to, or, or data and speculation and, and professional literature to back up the notion that women aren't really concerned so much with whether you're a nice guy or you're an asshole. This is a false dichotomy. What women are concerned with is, are, do you have values that you stand up for? Do you have something that you're after? Do I have to carry the burden of being the center of your universe so that you're constantly trying to please me? That's, that's too much effort. And if you, if you look around in the red pill community, you look around in the manosphere, and going back to books like David Data's um, Way of the Superior Man, you see guys picking up on this. What they notice is that women will tend to test men and what they're testing for is do you have a backbone basically and sometimes if like david data's book he talks about how women will test your resolve by providing a situation where you have the opportunity to put your foot down or disagree with them and according to data not data data the the writer uh that what a lot of women are looking for in that moment is to know that you actually have a backbone and that you actually will stand up for what you believe in. Because if you can stand up for her, so goes the reasoning, then you can stand up for your values. You can stand up for what's important. And she doesn't have to carry the burden of making all the decisions and being the most important person in your world and and, you know all of that nauseating stuff that just gets to be too much work for women, too much work for anybody. Yes. So that opens up a really interesting topic um, because I think what you're what you're approaching is the question of what do what do women really find attractive in men versus what are men told through society media um, you know by feminists and by other women like I think you and I have both observed that there is a there's a gap between. There's a discrepancy between what men are told women want and what they've observed in reality women actually go for, what they're attracted to. And because of this discrepancy, the manosphere exists. And dating coaches and pickup artists and a lot of other content creators online exist because they're trying to give men the red pill lens, basically. is uh, you know, what you've been told is not the truth. Here's the real truth. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and there's a lot of truth in, as far as I can tell, is my subjective judgment. But out of the red pill community and manosphere in general, there's a lot of truth. There are a lot of hucksters. There are a lot of um, the, the whole range of behavior because what's happening there is you have men who are trying to solve a problem. They're basically trying to solve the problem of how do I succeed in life? How do I succeed with women? And whenever you have a bunch of people asking a question like that, everybody's going to show up with their prescription from the people who actually know what they're talking about and have actually really studied hard. And I don't necessarily mean in school. Sometimes it's in school. Sometimes it's not. Some of these guys have, have really studied hard what's happening in the real world and they don't have a quote formal education but they're very educated so you have those guys who are well-intentioned and doing good work and then on the other extreme you have the the shysters and the hucksters and you have the guys who are uh, selling the program to get you laid and then you have the guys that are essentially just preying on women and there are women who prey on men you know goes both directions but this is a really interesting interesting space because it's sort of like it reminds me of, you know, like back in the, I don't know, I imagine back in the 1800s when you had the snake oil sales, salesman traveling around. And the reason you had snake oil salesmen alongside uh, barbers who would remove your teeth, alongside a surgeon who was working with a hacksaw that he, he bought at the hardware store, alongside a doctor who went to medical school, all of these people working in the same space because people had health problems that they needed solved. And there were some very common health problems going around because people didn't live very long back then. So the health problems tended to not be cancer and that sort of thing. They tended to be more, you know, just the run of the mill, your body breaking down or getting a disease. So you had all these people some well-intentioned, some not converging on the same space. And I think the manosphere is essentially the same thing because these guys, so many guys out there wake up one day and they realize that they've been sold a bill of goods in the way that they're supposed to talk to women and communicate women and what women actually expect and what women actually want. It's not what they see on TV. It's not what they see in advertisements. It's not what they, definitely not what they see in a Tom Hanks movie. It's something else, but they don't know what it is. So they go out and they look for the answers. Yes, and they're finding lots of different answers, some of which, in my opinion, are helpful mm -hmm. and useful, some of which are leading them astray, and some of them may actually be sending them down a, a dark and dangerous direction where they end up either giving up completely and going MGTOW. Uh, for those who don't know, men going their own way, you can Google that. Um, or they they don't go MGTOW, but they just you know emotionally disconnect from women and they they refuse to engage in long-term relationships uh, or they end up hating on women and i think those are poor interpretations of the information that they've received but unfortunately when you have a wild west of um, information sellers out there that's kind of what you get yeah and i agree with everything you said in terms of the the groups of guys and how this stuff is being used there's another group of guys it's a it's a silent group i don't know if it's a silent majority but it's certainly a silent group or a, at least a quiet group and that's guys who are relationship minded or maybe they're married or maybe they're you know, either one of those i guess they're relationship minded or they're married and they're taking this information and they're applying it to their relationships and it's useful for them like like they they learn I think one of the more common lessons I hear is I listen to guys talk about this. I keep my ear to the ground on, you know, in a couple different groups and I participate in a couple different groups. And one of the things I hear is that uh, one of the most common themes is men learning from this manosphere of red pill community, whatever it is, David Data's book, whatever it is, that they can have a backbone at home and it actually will work out well. And the trend seems to be that they have been passive and agreeable their whole marriage or their whole relationship to the point where they've really gotten on their women's nerves and when they start to stand up straight and when they start to say no and when they start to do what they want to do pursue the career choices they want to pursue do what they want in the bedroom or you know push, um, push themselves out in the world to excel even if it means that she's disappointed because she's home by herself once in a while like once they start standing up as men that's when the relationships at home start to come together. So that's a beautiful thing that has come out of that space. Yes, I agree with that very much. Um, a lot of men out there would be surprised to hear that women want you to say no sometimes. They want you to defend something and, and not just immediately um, give whatever is being asked without question. Because if you're always giving other people what they want, 
you never push back, then I think she she sees you as um, somebody she can't really trust, like somebody who, in the in the face of real dangers and real threats, is not going to um, do what it takes to pre- protect the family unit or or collect resources or what have you. And so that that integrity, that character, um, being able to defend what matters, I think, is a very important one. And I would add on to that to come back to your uh, book the um, the book about what women should look for in men sense of purpose which I think other people would call um, you know taking ambition taking initiative showing ambition having career goals having personal goals and making your mission your priority rather than simply making attracting women your priority I think that men who put their mission first are actually seen as more attractive as opposed to the guys who are just trying to pick up women. Absolutely. And there's there's a concept from evolutionary psychology about fitness. There, there's truthful signals of fitness, like, for example, a peacock has the big feathers, and you can't fake the big feathers. If they're healthy, they're healthy. If they're not, they're not. It's, it's nothing that you can fake. So the big, flourishing, beautiful feathers is an honest signal of fitness. But then there are other signals that are dishonest. They're fake. And they'll get you, you know, they'll get you a little bit down the road, but they won't get you long term success. And I think one example from nature is the fiddler crab. If he if he loses a, a claw, his big claw, he'll grow one back that is bigger, but it's also lighter and weaker. And so it's a it's a fake signal. Um, but the guys that are out there just trying to score and they haven't squared away their purpose yeah they can score they, they can learn the techniques and they can score but are they going to be able to maintain any kind of meaningful relationship with with a woman eh, the chances go down if you don't actually have yourself squared away yeah i agree i think that's the difference between you know having a set of tricks and techniques um versus having true sexual market value mm-hmm. in a long-term sense and really being a high quality man not just appearing like one but being one yeah and i think that's ultimately what what women are looking for yeah and that's what doesn't show up in tinder going back to that piece of the conversation of course of course um i want to just shift uh slightly the topic onto one of my favorite issues which is stoicism um you talked about this a little bit in your books and i think you've also mentioned it in some of your YouTube videos and speeches that you've delivered. Stoicism means different things to different people. Um, And I think that there's good, positive interpretations as well as some negative interpretations of it. Um, I have my own views, but I want to hear yours first. What what is Stoicism to you? We're talking the philosophy or the vernacular, um, a person is Stoic, meaning they contain their emotions. Yeah, I guess... um, my question would be, how how do you think society views Stoicism in pop culture today? Right. And then second after that would be, um, what is your vision of positive Stoicism in, in, ter- in terms of the version that people should bring into their lives? Right. Well, I'm glad you're not asking about the philosophy because I'm not equipped to talk about the philosophy. I'm not, I'm not well read enough, but um, yeah. Just little little pieces here and there. But in terms of the personality characteristic of Stoicism, this is somebody who's able to contain their emotions. And this is something when the APA came out with their guidelines for working with boys and men in 2019 that were very controversial. The reason they were controversial is because they took a bunch of traits that cluster around men, don't belong to men, they just cluster around men, like stoicism, that containing your emotions, and they said, well, it's just bad. It's just, it's just on the whole, it's just harmful. And we need to men, we need men to act differently. So one of the fours that they listed, I think there was stoicism, competitiveness, aggression, and one more, maybe it'll come to me later, but stoicism was one of the big four that they said, oh, it's just bad. It's just blanket bad. Well, if you think about what they're actually saying, that that's actually a, a really stupid thing to say because the ability to contain your emotions can clearly be taken too far. It can be taken to the point where you are drinking, for example, to avoid coming into contact with your emotions, which doesn't work because you wake up the next day and you feel much worse than you did before. But it can be taken too far. And I think 
in fairness to the APA, that's probably a large part of what they were talking about. That's not all they were talking about. They, they have a, a particular political agenda that doesn't particularly matter for our, our discussion here. But that's stoicism taking too far, an unwillingness to come into contact with your own emotions. But how can you get by in life without a little bit of stoicism? One of the first things we teach kids is you, you contain your outbursts. You don't bite your friends. You don't throw things at people. You don't act like a little psychopath. And all of that is teaching kids you contain your emotions and then you express them appropriately. Like You don't just omnidirectionally shoot your whatever reaction you have all over the universe. You contain yourself. So... For example, um, one of the one of the beautiful things about men and women operating together, and I'll, I'll paint a very traditional picture that may or may not fit with anybody's particular life, but a mom and dad and some kids are driving down the road and it's raining, and they blow out a tire and then they can't. There's no cell service or whatever. They're stuck out there with a blown tire, five of them in the car, and if the mother happens to be using some of the characteristics that cluster around femininity, which doesn't mean men don't have these capabilities. It just means they cluster more around femininity of the ability to attend to emotions and to um, give people a hug, so to speak, and let them know that, yeah, this really sucks. This is terrible. Um, this is a bad situation and comforting people in that way. So, so acknowledging the difficulty of the situation and then shifting the emotions in a very feminine way to, to a different direction. Women tend to be very good at that. Men tend to be, uh, okay, so so traditionally, if she's doing the traditional thing, um, which doesn't make her good or bad, just is she doing the traditional thing, then she's attending to the emotional component of what's going on in that moment. And maybe part of that is the father being kind of annoyed about what's what's going on. The father, if he's doing the traditional thing, the thing that the APA dislikes, he's going to contain his emotions. And the reason he's going to contain his emotions is so that he can go out in the rain and he can take, you know, jack the car up and he can loosen, well, you loosen the lug nuts first, right? Because if you're, if you're a traditional guy, you know these things, you loosen the lug nuts, you, you lift up the car, then you take the lug nuts off, then you replace the tire while it's cold and while it's raining and while your hands are slipping and maybe you bang your knuckle, you contain your emotions so that you can get the job done and so that you can get back on the road. So if a mother and father are working really well together, it doesn't have to be that they're doing it in that configuration, but somebody needs to attend to the emotional content of the situation and somebody needs to get the job done. And so how can you say that stoicism is bad when stoicism is absolutely necessary just to get through your drive to work in the morning or to get through a meeting or to get, you know, you go to the store and somebody cuts you off with their shopping cart. Do you punch them in the face? No, you act stoic. You contain yourself. So anyway, there's stoicism. Okay, great. <laughs> I get a little fired uh, up about it. I'm not being very stoic right now. That's, that's okay. We don't have to be stoic all the time. I like that example, though, um, because it illustrates a few things. One is the role of emotion. Um, but also the, you know, a bit of gender difference and gender differences do not mean better or worse. You didn't make a value judgment. What you're saying is that in traditional masculinity and traditional femininity, they're, they're complementary. They work with each other like the yin and yang, mm -hmm. um, if I can use that uh, image. Um, and there's a polarity there. And I would say that not only in a mutual support sense, of dealing with challenges um, you know the father and the mother have different roles but also even in the courting phase the dating getting to know each other I think the male energy and the female energy are attracted to each other not because they're the same but because they're different we right. like the differences yeah and so um, yeah. that that kind of branches onto another question I have which is uh, why does it seem like so many different institutions in our culture are trying to erase gender differences and make men more feminine and women more masculine. You know, women are encouraged now to be aggressive and competitive and um, to, to be fierce, you know, like the Beyonce example. And, and then men are encouraged to be soft and sensitive and emotional and yeah. more caring and all these things. Um, and of course, there's, there's some benefit in doing that, but it can be taken too far in my opinion uh, do you have any thoughts about this well i think men yeah i have thoughts all day about this but uh, yeah men and women both need to have some the similar characteristics or, or they, they need to have a full toolbox so 
Um, in the example of the car, maybe it's the man who acts out the stoicism. Maybe he's more practiced in that, but the woman has to be stoic too. She has to be able at some point to contain her fear and her emotions and say, okay, kids, let's tell some stories. Let's play a game while dad's out doing his thing, or maybe we'll go help him or whatever. She's got to be able to contain her emotions to help everyone else contain their emotions. And same for the father. It's just different manifestations of the same thing. But yeah, I do see this trend where we're trying to get turn men into women and women into men. And I don't particularly understand it because I'm not good at looking at uh, the big picture, the big, big picture society, because I work with individuals all day long. So for me, the individual is a unit of analysis. And so when I look at these big trends, like when I watch Star Wars, why is it that the the male, the, the male antagonist in that, I guess Kylo Ren is, is the, he's the new Darth Vader, he has no stoicism. He's he's just emotionally sloppy. He's having temper tantrums. He's practically crying half the time. He's just he's just a goofball emotionally. And then the woman is the one that kicks everybody's ass. She comes in and she's tough and she's strong and she's very masculine and she's she's the only one who can walk into a scene and kick everybody's ass. And I, I don't really understand why. I mean, it's fine. I'm not mad at that, but I don't understand. You know, men aren't particularly attracted to that. And women aren't particularly attracted to the Kylo Ren characters. I don't really understand why we're going in this direction. I know people. I know there's politics behind it, but it's above my grade. Mm. Right. Well, that we could have a whole conversation just about uh, these broader cultural issues, but I think we'll avoid that for today. We can, we'll just make note of it. Okay. Um, Duly noted. On a few previous episodes of this podcast, uh, stoicism actually came up with the other guests and. When it's mentioned in a negative sense, I think what they are talking about is the inability to talk about your problems. Mm -hmm. So if a man is completely stoic um, to the extreme where he never seeks help for his psychological issues, his behavioral, you know, drug and alcohol addictions or um, any other problematic behaviors or problematic beliefs and thoughts and feelings that he's having, the the not seeking help for that is not useful it's not helping him no. i think you might agree on on that point yeah i absolutely agree on that point and i will i will give the american psychological associates because i complain about them loudly and frequently because of the stance that they have toward men and the reason i'm so passionate about complaining about them is because they have not made it easier for men to come and seek help. They've made it harder because this document that they came out with a couple of years ago was very shaming and it was degrading and it spoke down to men. Now, they have a point that there are a lot of men out there that are dealing with things that dealing with them by them by themselves, like you say, and they would really benefit and everyone around them would really benefit if they would face what it is that they need to face, if they would face that pain voluntarily. Um, the APA comes in and says, well, shame on you. You're a man. You're doing everything wrong. Well, man's not going to respond to that. They, and frankly, I don't think they understand how men think. I think they're frightened of men. I think they find men to be very scary and, and mysterious. And, and we're not that. We're not scary. We're not mysterious. We just think a little bit differently than the very feminine mindset that exists in my profession and certainly in the American Psychological Association. So I think I got pretty far afield from your, your comment. But there it is. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay. It's always fun, these discussions, even if you go on a tangent. Um, yes, these those guidelines. Um, and by the way, I will link your YouTube channel in the description of this video so that uh, the viewers can go check out your response to the APA guidelines on treating boys and men. Because you had a few different videos uh, where you expressed your views on those. Um, and I want people to go watch those later. Um, I want to give you an opportunity if, if you have some thoughts on... Is, is there a Sean Smith alternative version of APA guidelines? If you were to just kind of um, put out your own high level messages on how other psychologists, counselors, clinicians should deal with male patients when they're coming in that that do not include talking about uh, privilege and patriarchy and um, all these things. But, you know, your version of it. Do you have something like this? Well, yeah, I have some some thoughts on them. Let me gather my thoughts here. One is that um, most clinicians, there's a difference in, there's a, a, a very clear split in the field of psychology. There's the academic side where all the research comes out and, and it's very politically motivated, a lot of that research, not all of it, but a lot of it. Uh, evolutionary psychologists 
psychology tend to be pretty good at being apolitical and just interested in how things work. But the social psychology, uh, like the Journal of Social Psychology, for example, it's, it's shamelessly political. So there's that side of the profession and they're dealing with ideas and they're doing with trying to shape the culture. And on that side, I would also put the administrative side. So I would put administrators in large uh, facilities like prisons and so forth. And I would put the administrative side, like the APA and even local local uh, psychological associations like the Colorado Psychological Association here where I am, I would put that, lump them roughly together with the academic side. Then we have the clinical side. And the clinical side is very different because you have people who are in the trenches every day working with individual men and individual women and individual children. And so when you hear things coming out of the academic side that says, oh, it's all about privilege, it's all about patriarchy, it's all about whiteness, all about whatever it is, because you know, they go through these trends, and you're a clinician, most of the clinicians I know, frankly, aren't really aware of what's coming out of the academic side. And unless it's particularly relevant to what they work on, like maybe they work with anxiety disorders, and so they're an anxiety listserv, and they, maybe they come by an article through their listserv that's about anxiety. But when you're dealing with individuals on a daily basis, it's really hard to buy into these broad sweeping stereotypes that come out of the academic side, because you, you, you're dealing with people and you're dealing with their individual problems. And so it's, it's hard to think of a person as the member of a group, which is the way the academic side tends to think of people. So that's the first point is that, frankly, most psychologists out there are pretty good at what they do. They're not, they're not really buying into this. They're, they're, overwhelmingly, they're on one side of the political spectrum, but they're still pretty good at what they do. And as far as um, alternatives to the APA, there was a, oh man, I, I wish, I wish I'd known we were going to talk about this thing because there was a, a piece on psychology today that was written by a psychologist who happens to be a male. And he came up with 10 alternatives to the 10 guidelines that the APA re, um, produced. And they were things like understanding what men contend with when they get divorced. And they were um, things like understanding that men connect through action sometimes more than words. And this guy really got into some really nice points about male psychology and that makes sense of just how we communicate and how we're, how we're slightly different in the way we behave than women are. And it wasn't shaming. It was just sort of, hey, here's, here's how guys work. There's also a guy out of, uh, a guy, he's a psychologist out of the UK named John Barry. And I've got a couple of his books right, right here on my screen. One is the uh, Palgrave Handbook for Male Mental Health. And another one just came out a couple of months ago called... Um, I don't know, I'd give up and get up and get it, but I'd make all kinds of noise doing it. Um, it's a new handbook for male psychology, but if you go to Amazon and you search John Barry and Louise Litton, you'll find, you'll find this book. And it's another really nice volume that just breaks down in a non-ideological fashion the things that men struggle with that are particular to men, not exclusive to men, but particular to men, and how to think about it as a clinician in a way that just is understanding and not judging. So answer your question, there's, there's a lot of good stuff out there and there are a lot of good clinicians. Excellent, good. Well, thank you for uh, bringing those books to our attention. I will look them up online, try and find the links and put them in the description here so that people can go check it out on their own time. Um, I think I, I agree with you that we need more non-politicized, non-ideological looks at gender issues, both from the male and the female perspective where they can just say, hey, there's there's common human qualities that we all struggle with but then there's male challenges there's female challenges and we shouldn't be judgy but we should just um you know recognize these differences and find constructive ways to address them agreed yeah mm -hmm. yeah um good well i think uh we're coming towards the end of our time is there any final topic that you wanted to touch on before we close no i just uh, i appreciate the the chance to chat about it you and i met in person a couple of years ago and it's good to see you again and uh, yeah i appreciate it yes the feelings mutual um well i will encourage our guests to check out your online content uh on youtube as well as on twitter um you are at iron shrink and you have your own website docsmith.co which we will link here um, there's quite a lot more content that uh, people can go and dig into to learn about Sean Smith and your different views on issues. 
Um, so I want to thank you for coming on and taking the time to speak with me today and hope uh, we can do it again sometime in the future. Sounds good. Thanks, Warren. Thanks. Okay. Take care. Thank you.